Good morning. Um, we're going to be continuing our study in the book of Galatians. We're in Galatians chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 1 to 7. Uh, as way of reminder, um, if you want to join us for corporate prayer on Wednesdays from noon to noon 30, you can sign up for the text blast on the website. And you'll get a text blast on Wednesday morning with the ID and password for the Zoom call. So three of us folks, it's a great opportunity to join us as we ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the field. He said if you ask that, he will do it. And so what an awesome opportunity we have to engage with the Lord in prayer. So I want to encourage you to sign up, get that blast. Uh, and if you want to join and don't have the text blast, want to email me, I can send you that information, but it's easier if you get the text blast. That way I'm not emailing like 73 different people and then a bunch of people get the text blast. So just get the text blast and you'll get all that you need, okay? Y'all look like you want to hurt me again this week. Like, are y'all generally unhappy people? It's like everybody's like, kick him in the face. No, like, we'll be happy, right? It's okay, Jesus is alive. His word is the living sword, right? And it is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. And we get to read and study and we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, right? And we're going to read about that and study that this morning. So if you got a Bible, flip over to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 1 to 7. If you don't have one, no worries. I'm going to read the passage for us. Um, very important as we study to get this. This is, this is huge. This is a massive, massive, massive passage for us. Not only are Jews, Gentiles, slaves, free, women, men, no longer divided by those lines. We learned that last week. There are no dividing lines that should create hostility between those people. Not only are we no longer divided on those lines and are now one in Christ, but our oneness is built upon one of the most absolutely glorious theological realities that we could ever set our minds on. And that is through faith in Jesus, we are made children of God. For those of us in a, a subculture of Christianity, it is easy to hear those words and skip over them. But those are some of the most glorious words that your mouth can speak. That through faith in Jesus, we get to be children of God. And that basis is why there is no longer dividing lines between Jew and Gentile, slave, free, men and women. But we are one body in Christ. Galatians 3, 25 to 26 that we looked at last week says this. And by the way, the notes are on the website, MitchJolly.com. You can see this there and go back and study as well. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. Through faith, we are children of God, and that's huge. And Knowing God by J.I. Packer, I recommend it to you. If you're not a Christian, read it. It will bless you. It will introduce you to the living God of the universe, Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian, it will help you know Him better. It's a Christian classic. Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Here's, here's what he asks and here's how he answers it. The question he asks is, what is a Christian? And he says, the richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as his Father. Wow. Wow. And he goes on to say, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. Wow. The predominant thought in our mind, Packer says, is in this scripture in Galatians chapter 3 and 4 that defines what it means to be a Christian is we get to be daughters and sons of God. And just to make the point abundantly clear that we are all under the curse of sin, Paul's going to switch analogies on us at the beginning of chapter 4. 
We move from the law being our guardian, the language Paul used being imprisoning everything under sin and everyone under sin. We move from that analogy of imprisonment under the law to children who are no different in their relationship to a father, whether they're a slave or a child. And he makes that switch in chapter 3, verse 29, when he says, And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So this is going to be the point of verse 1 to 3. And it's that apart from Jesus... Apart from Jesus, we are enslaved to the spiritual principles of the world. Now let's take Galatians 4, 1 to 7 and read it together. Now I say that as long as the heir is a child, he is differs, or he is different. By the way, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. I've cut my teeth. As a young Christian, I had a New American Standard, which is God's favorite version of the Bible. And as a Greek and Hebrew guy, I love the NASB because you could cheat off of it. I didn't cheat in seminary, just so you know. But if I did cheat in seminary, it was to look at the New American Standard to help me get over some verb tenses in Greek. But I'm not telling you I did that. I'm just saying if I did, that's what I would have done. And then I went to the ESV, and now I'm back to the CSB, which is more like the NASB, which John loves. But it's a little easier to read for us dyslexic people. So anyway, here we go. So I was reading it in ESV. And I'm looking out of the CSB and I confuse myself, so I'm sorry. Galatians 4, 1. Now I say that as long as the heir is a child, he differs in no way from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Instead, he is under guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were in slavery under the elements of the world. That's the key phrase in verse 1 to 3 in the switching of the analogy. When the time came to completion, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. Wow. Absolutely astounding. But once again, Paul's going to make sure we don't miss the bad news. Because there is no good news without some bad news. And the bad news is we were under the curse of the law. We were under sin and we were shown to be sinners. He switches the analogies now to an heir, whether a slave or a son. And he reminds us that apart from Jesus, we are enslaved to the spiritual principles of the world. Paul wants to ensure that his readers and us know nothing but faith in Jesus alone saves. Their status as Jew does not get them closer to salvation than the Gentile who did not have the law. So once again, he reminds them whether Jew or Gentile, you are both under something that keeps you away from God. He wants them to understand they're not only rescued from keeping the law, but they're also rescued from the spiritual principles that has enslaved mankind since Genesis chapter 3. The idea Paul's trying to get across is not the illustration of children and slaves as heirs, but what the illustration points to. I read so much in studying this passage, it made way too much of heirs and children, and it's not the point, it's just the analogy. So I'm not going to get into the minutia of that and make you lose the point, okay? If you want to go read that and be super academic nerdy, go for it. But let's not miss Paul's point with the analogy. And the point is this. That whether they're Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female, that apart from Christ, they all, we all, are under the curse of the principalities and powers of a world system that stands opposed to God and His kingdom. There is a barrier of sin that keeps us from God and enslaved to the powerful forces of sin. Apart from Jesus, we are under the slavery of principles belonging to the world system. What is that slavery? Well, he says here at the end of verse 3, in the same way, we also, when we were children, were in slavery under the elements of the world. The language Paul uses when he says elements of the world is language he uses elsewhere to describe spiritual forces of darkness 
that sit over people and enslave them to the dark kingdom. This word also has, in some translations, actually say the word elements. Because it's a word that's also used to describe the elements of created order like fire and wind and earth and water. But Paul's clearly not saying, you guys are all enslaved under water. Right? That's not his point. He uses this word that also carries a spiritual connotation to it. Meaning that there are principles in the world, and he will say this in the Ephesians letter, principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in the heavenly places. He wants them to understand that apart from Jesus, people, mankind, created order is under the slavery of a dark system that keeps them away from Christ. And here's how he's going to say it to the Ephesians. And that little letter, which is next, if you're looking through the New Testament, it's Galatians, then Ephesians. In chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, he's going to say this to those folks. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked. So in their sin, how did they walk? According to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. So the law revealed our sin, it showed it to be sin, it increased it, and revealed that we are all under the dark influence of a world system apart from Jesus. This explains a lot when we have gospel conversations with folks who don't see and understand. And if you're involved in your city, you know what that's like when you're having conversations and you can see that they cannot see what is so plain to you. And what makes that plainness not plain is the fact that they are enslaved to a dark kingdom that blinds people. Matter of fact, Paul, the writer of Galatians, will also say to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 to 6, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ who is God. So apart from Jesus, the world is in a spiritual darkness that cannot see, perceive, understand, or know who Jesus is. So the question becomes, how does God save a people who are lawbreakers and under the spiritual darkness of a dark kingdom? How's God going to do that? Right? How did God do that in you? How did God do that in me? And if you're here this morning and he hasn't done that in you, the question you should ask is, how is God going to overcome slavery to a law and slavery to a dark system that is keeping you blind? Well, here's how he's going to answer it. And he starts in verse 4. The first part of verse 4. I'm just going to read verse 4 to 7 because it's absolutely glorious. And I believe God can do more in the reading of his word than perhaps I can do in another 30 minutes of unpacking it for you. And by the way, God works through the preaching of His Word. That's why we open the Bible and speak from it and preach from it because the Bible teaches us it's a way God teaches His people. It's one of the ways He drives away darkness. It's one of the ways He builds faith. So we do that and we're not going to not do that. But I also believe that through the reading of God's Word, He can chase away blindness too because His Word is living and active, right? And so it does supernatural things so it won't hurt us to read it again. Galatians 4, verse 4 to 7. When the time came to completion, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Wow. And because you are sons, right? Because they are sons, because they believe the good news, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. So how do people enslaved to the law and enslaved to dark principles get free of that? Well, it's the work of God. And we see in the first part of verse 4, God worked His eternal plan. When the time came to completion. Do you understand what a monumental statement that is? When the time came to completion? God's work in saving mankind. You remember all the way back to Genesis 3. God promised Adam and Eve that there would come one from them. There would be a person, a particular, he called it a seed, meaning a descendant of the man and the woman, who would crush the head of the serpent that brought about the destruction. And Paul has made the argument to the Galatians, Jesus was that seed, he was that one, he was the promised one. And he says, when the time came to completion, meaning that just at the right time, meaning God was working a sovereign plan. 
God has never been, never will be a victim of the world or the times set up by a world system. God was working a sovereign plan. When we started the book of Galatians, I introduced you to the eternal covenant of salvation. And that's this, that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit before time began, before there was ever sin, in perfect unity together, one God, three distinct persons, the Christian teaching of the Trinity. The Father wanted to give the Son a gift, and He wanted to give Him a gift of a humanity that would be rescued so that they would worship Him for the rescue. And He would do it by the work of the Holy Spirit. So before God created a single thing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit made a sovereign plan to give the Son a people. <laughs> Which is why when you read the Gospel of John, and I'm writing little blogs every day on walking us up to, to Easter Sunday, and we're getting in the middle of John, and Jesus keeps saying things like, all oh, those the Father has given to me are going to come to me. What's He talking about? He's talking about this covenant that the Father, Son, and the Spirit made together that Father's going to give the Son a people. And when He speaks, they will hear His voice because they don't hear the voice of strangers. They only hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. So when the Good Shepherd speaks, those the Father has given the Son will hear and they will come to life and they will come to Him. And He says, I will hold them in My hand and I will lose none of those that the Father has given Me. Glory to God. Isn't that fun? So when the time came to completion... At just the right moment, determined by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before time began, like eternally, right? Like time should, time, time is so little. Eternality should blow your mind. Before there was time. So in other words, God's plan isn't hindered by time. And I know that's probably more nerdy than you wanted to hear this morning. But the universe screams this reality in its endlessness, right? And the universe is created. Nothing we've done has found the edge of the universe where a satellite bounced off of it and bounced down. This isn't the Truman Show. But that eternality or that, that endlessness of created order was created. And in eternity past, Father, Son, and Spirit made a plan that at just the right time, Jesus would come as what we're about to read, and He would die in our place for our sin, be buried, and rise and ascend to the Father to complete all things. When the time for completion came, I mean, God is working His plan. So how were people rescued from the curse of darkness and the law? God worked His plan. God sovereignly orchestrating salvation history. Jesus' entrance into time and space was just at the right theological, religious, and political moment to take advantage of the history God was moving for His purposes. Do you think the Roman Empire came to power accidentally? Do you think the Pax Romana was an accident? Do you think Roman roads that are still in existence today was an accident? No, God gave wisdom to unbelievers to do great things so that at just the right time with Alexander the Great, by the way, this isn't a history course, but God had Alexander the Great spread his rule so that most of the known world would speak the same language. The Romans would come and build roads so that at just the right time when Jesus entered time and space and he took on flesh and he died for us and he launched his church, they would walk on roads made by unbelievers, speak a language that was spread by unbelievers to spread the fragrance of the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ to the world at just the right time. So how do people get rescued from darkness? God works his plan. Isn't that fun? Right? So if you're in Christ today, it's not something you did. It's not something you earned. It's not a status you had. It was given freely by God because He worked His sovereign plan. As the hymn writer said, He treasures up His bright designs and He works His sovereign will. Well, how else do we get rescued? We see in the second part of verse 4 and then in verse 5, God sent His Son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. God sent His Son. I'm just going to speed through these because each of them is really a sermon by itself. And if I get hung up here, it'll be a while. So I'll leave you to study. Because you have the Holy Spirit too, which He's going to say in just a moment. The Holy Spirit just doesn't get given to a few elite. All those in Christ get all of God. 
Okay? So God sent His Son. Jesus was and is God. The most absolutely stunning, mind-blowing thing Jesus says to me in the Gospels is He calls Himself the Son of Man, which is blatantly out of Daniel chapter 7, where the Ancient of Days is sitting on His throne, and the Son of Man comes and receives a kingdom from the Ancient of Days that fills the whole earth. And when Jesus calls Himself the Son of Man, He is blatantly tying His identity back to Daniel chapter 7, where God said there will be a Son who will come, a Son of Man who will be given a kingdom that will fill the earth. That was God's plan. And then He comes along in His argument with the Pharisees in John chapter 8, and he's talking about Abraham. And, he get, and, and they say to him, you're not even 50 years old yet. And have you seen Abraham? And Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones to stone him to death because they knew what he meant. What did he mean? What did he say? He said, I'm the I am. I'm the God of the Exodus. I'm the one who showed Moses God's identity because I'm that God. And they knew what he meant, which is why they're going to stone him to death for blasphemy. Jesus was and is God. So God the Father sent God His Son. Jesus is the eternal God. Again, this writer, Paul, will say it to a church in a city called Colossae. In the first chapter of his letter to them, in verse 15 to 17, he will say, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers, or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and in Him hold, in Him all things hold together. So God sent His Son. The next thing we read here is, He was born of a woman. Not only is Jesus all God, but Jesus was real flesh and real blood. He's all man. One of the beautiful mysteries of the faith is that Jesus isn't just God, He is also all man. He is 100% God, 100% man, at one time, in one place. Why did He do that? Well, there are multitudes of reasons why He did that. I would encourage you to go read Hebrews chapter 2. To give you a quick summary, Jesus is real flesh and real blood in order to be a merciful and faithful high priest who's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. He's truly human, and He is what redeemed humanity looks like. Let me just throw something out on you for just a moment. One of the beautiful things God does for us in salvation is makes it possible for us to be real, really human. We have a tendency to be very Gnostic in our theology. And Gnostic means flesh bad, spirit good. So beat up the flesh. Mistreat the flesh. Because spiritual stuff is more important. That's a heresy. Jesus shows us that by being all flesh and all blood also. And when He's raised to life, and we're told later we're going to be like that, Jesus isn't a spirit floating around. He eats with them. He moves around with them. He has a real physical existence. Paul's going to deal with this in the book of Corinthians also. So we have Jesus who is all God so He can save us. But He's all man so He understands life with us so that what the writer of Hebrews will tell us also is He is a merciful and faithful high priest. Because He understands He can empathize with those who are tempted and struggle because He was just like us. God sent His Son, born of a woman. Philippians 2, 5-11 tells us what this true humanity looks like in humility in flesh and blood and what we are and will be in Him. Part of your growth in Christ is to discover what it is to be really human. And what Jesus is doing in the new creation work of the gospel is making us more into real humans that aren't cursed by sin. When all things are wrapped up and the eternal kingdom has come, you're still going to be human, just with no sin. Isn't that awesome? And we now get to live in that new creation reality in what the Bible calls sanctification. Cleaning us up and making us more like Jesus, who is the real and true human that we will be like in that day. That gives me hope. That's exciting. 
That's the eternal kingdom of heaven. But he also learned he was born under the law. Jesus came living under the law that he gave. And he knew we could never keep. And would himself keep and fulfill so that we would be, he would be a merciful and faithful high priest who understands his creature's difficulty. He lived under the curse of the law so that we would, he could understand how it affects flesh and bone. This is the passage I was referring to just a moment ago. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Ever stop to think that when temptation comes, Jesus knows it? And not only does he know it, he's tasted the full force of temptation because he never gave in. What do you and I do? We give in when the wind speed of temptation hits about 50. Jesus has taken the full brunt and full force of all temptation and withstood it and won. So that we get the wind speed of temptation gets to 50 and it's blowing hard on us. We're like, ah, I just want to sin. Jesus is going, I got you. I got you. It's okay. Right? So he is a merciful and faithful high priest. But we learn that he came to redeem those also under the law. He came to those as born under the law to redeem those under the law. Jesus having kept the law is able thus to die in our place for our sin and fix the mess we're in due to sin. And then he takes us from under law to being children of God. So he redeems us from the law, meaning there's something that needs to be redeemed and we're a mess. Not a soul in this room is not a mess. The most put together, smartest, life together person in this room is an absolute mess and you know it. No matter what the veneer you put on, you're a mess. And he came to redeem us who are under the law to make us daughters and sons of God and begin the cleanup process to make us truly human. But we also learn here that we receive adoption as children. We were not children, but through faith, we became children. Like Packer said, you know what Christianity is? It's to be a daughter, to be a son of God. And if you get that, you know what it is to be a Christian. If you don't get that, you have really no clue what it means to be a Christian. We get to receive adoption as children. We were not children, but through faith we became children. I absolutely love the reality that adoption as God's children is rooted in the eternal nature of God and part of the eternal covenant of redemption. Adoption isn't something God created in response to sin. The adoption of God is rooted in the very nature of God. You need to sit on that for a moment. Because the whole idea of a slave and an heir is important for us. As Paul said, they're not any different. Meaning, there are no natural born children of God. In other words, those who had the law were no more children than the Gentiles. Paul's whole point in the illustration is every single one of you, whether Jew or Gentile, are under the same curse of sin. There is no natural advantage. You're all children of the enemy. Paul will say to the, to the Ephesians, you are children of the enemy. Jesus is going to say to the Pharisees in John 8, you belong to your father the devil. You lie because he lies. You speak his native tongue. Apart from Jesus, we are children of the enemy. But through faith in Christ, God works His supernatural sovereign plan to take people who are not children and make them children. Isn't that fun? So if you're in Christ today, it's not because you were on the right track and had an advantage. The gospel's at your fingertips. No. You're under the curse of a dark kingdom and under the curse of the law, and you belong to the enemy. But God, being rich in mercy, worked His sovereign plan and He took children to Himself and made them His own. This truth is so holy 
And so amazing, Paul creates the word here, adoption, to communicate it. Now, as a language guy, if you've been at Three Rivers a while, you know our connection to our city and the work we do in our city and why adoption is important to us. And so you'll recall me teaching you this a long time ago. I can find no etymological connection to the concept of adoption prior to Paul's creating it here in Galatians chapter 4. The word translated adoption is unique to Paul. And it's a compound word. We are son or daughter in the feminine. Thesis, to make. It means to make a child. Now I think it's important to recognize the concept of adoption Paul didn't create. That's rooted in the nature of God. And you're going to see that if you read like 2 Samuel chapter 7 where we learn that God says about Solomon, I will make him, I will adopt him as my son, I'll make him my son and I'll be a father to him. This is God speaking out of his nature about the king that he's going to set over his people. So adoption is rooted in the nature and character of God. So the idea has, is there because God created all things and it's rooted in the nature and character of God. But the language to speak that holy reality comes out of the Bible as first noted by Paul. It just makes sense that God would give His people the word to communicate the holy reality of who He is. And so this idea of adoption is rooted in the nature and character of God. And it's so holy that this word adoption finds its root in the book of Galatians. And shows us some of the beautiful nature of who we are as the people of God. Unless you think adoption secondary to biology, remember what we've just taught. There are no people who have a closer connection than others. All are under the curse of sin and separated from God as under the power of a dark kingdom. Whether Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, woman, we're all separated. So everybody in the kingdom of God are adopted as daughters and sons of God. Meaning, we'll get to this in just a moment, practical adoption is no less, no more than biology. Because there are no classes of sinners and there are no classes of saved people. One in Christ. Apart from Christ, sinners under condemnation. That make sense? We create class systems, not God. Paul's drawing from this adoption formula in the Old Testament. You can go read those notes. You want to take time with them. You can study them later. We see in verse 6. That because we've been made children of God and brought out from under the law and under the rule of the dark kingdom as adopted daughters and sons of God, as children, we get the Holy Spirit to live in us who brings us to life and brings to life. I can't even read my own writing. I promise you this is written in good English. So I'm going to try again. Verse 6. As children of God, we get the Holy Spirit to live in us, comma, who brings to life our father-child relationship. Look at verse 6. And because you're sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. As children of God, we get the Holy Spirit to live in us, who then brings to life the relationship father to child. Therefore, we cry out, Father, you, God, are my Father, all of us in Christ are really children of God. Isn't that awesome? And it's only those in Christ, by the way. That's good language in a lot of pop culture for speaking about humanity generally as daughters and sons of God, but the Bible teaches us you're only a daughter or son of God if you're in Christ. Paul's made that argument, really. Remember, if you're under the law, you're under the dark curse of the dark kingdom. Not a son, not a daughter. But if you're in Christ, all of us are children of God. We know this because we get all of God in the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And we have God as our Father. And let me just say this to you. I want you to understand this because we live in a Christian subculture where you run across a bunch of Christians from a bunch of different backgrounds who are going to tell you a bunch of different things. There is no classification system of greater and lesser Holy Spirit in any Christian. In other words, you have all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. The question is, are you tapping into that by living obediently and faithfully before the Lord? 
I don't have more Holy Spirit than you. You don't have more than me. Right? He tells us here that because we've come to Jesus, He has given us His Holy Spirit who animates and brings to life this relationship of father and child where we can truly say, God is our, my, your Father. Wow. And then we see in verse 7, as children, we're heirs of God. Verse 7, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. Heirs are recipients of all that belongs to the Father. Listen, we could go on an eschatological rant here, and I would really like to. But do you understand that as daughters and sons of God, the earth being renewed and promised to be completed is ours? This isn't some Mormon junk, right? Mormons are off, they're not, no, not Christian, going to hell. Sorry, I probably shouldn't have said that. This is going on the internet. I'm trying to be nice and tolerant. They're not Christians. They don't believe the gospel. And they teach you're going to get your planet, some other planet somewhere. That would be awesome if you did, but that's just not true, right? The Bible teaches us God made this earth. And prior to the curse of sin, Adam and Eve were sent to reproduce in it and till it and make much of it without sin for the glory of God and their great joy. Before sin. Right? And we read all through the Old Testament and the prophets that what God's going to do is He's going to recreate things. He's going to make a new creation. And we see in Revelation 21, God pulls that off. He regenerates and makes all things new and sets His people. This bride who comes down out of heaven, the people of God, this new Jerusalem, this people of God that's perfectly, perfectly completed. God is with them. He dwells with them and among them. They see Him face to face. And it says that the kings of the earth will bring all of their produce in before the Lord and lay it down as a sacrifice. Isn't that awesome? That, that's beautiful. And we are heirs of that. That's what we inherit. When you read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 3 to 10 with these incredible statements. The poor in spirit get the kingdom as theirs. The mourning are going to be comforted. The humble inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are going to be filled. The merciful will be shown mercy. The pure in heart will see God. The peacemakers are sons of God. And those who are persecuted get the kingdom. Meaning as heirs of God, the promise for us is, is by the way, when Paul calls us new creatures, he's pulling from Isaiah. When Isaiah said he's going to make a new creation, Paul's calling us that new creation. We're the first part of God making all things new. So if you're a Christian, you brought in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are the very first sprouts of God making all things new. And when He finishes created order, we inherit that as heirs so that with Him face to face, the eternal kingdom of heaven is a physical, real human to God relationship face to face in a new created order right here. That Man, Hank Williams was close. If heaven ain't a lot like Dixie, I don't want to go. He was a lot closer. We want to give him some credit for. It's going to be like Dixie without sin. Right? It's going to be good. Don't quote me on that. That's probably not true. But it's better than our concept of a funky spiritual Gnostic flying around in a spirit realm. Like, what's that? That's trashy. I don't want any of that. Right? Real humanity is godly and good. Sin wrecked it and Jesus is repairing it. So as children, we're heirs of God. So what are we going to do with this? How are we going to apply this? Listen, man, I know some of y'all listen to Joe Rogan podcast and you sit there for three hours. So don't even tell me, like, oh my God, I appreciate that 50 minutes. I can't handle it. That's a lie. I'm not even going to buy that anymore. I know what y'all do. I know. So don't even, don't even, like, I can't handle that. Yes, you can. That's, that's blindness talking. That's the enemy. So what are we going to do with this? If you've not believed in Jesus, turn from sin and slavery to a dark kingdom today and trust Jesus. 
The only way your eyes can be opened to see that you're in slavery to a dark kingdom is what we've talked about this morning. The glorious work of Jesus Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to cover the sins of people. So if you turn to Him in faith, He'll give you a new heart, place His Spirit in you, and you'll be a child of God. That message is so powerful, it wrecks a dark kingdom and takes people to life. So if you have experienced life this morning, you know it. It's like, did I? No, you know. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It makes sense. I get it. If that's you, come talk to us. If you've not believed in Jesus, turn from sin and slavery to a dark kingdom to be called and be in reality a child of God. Number two, if you're a Christian, and that may represent most of us in this room, stop trying to earn God's favor. Live as a child of God that already has His favor. One of the ways we see in our flesh slavery to law is this desire and felt need, which is false, to do penance before God to pay for what we just did. If you're in Christ, there's no penance to be paid. He paid it all. The cross is where God the Father executed all wrath for my sin and yours on the Son. So that when the Son speaks through His Word, those that the Father gave Him will hear Him and come to life and follow Him because they don't follow the voice of strangers. He paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin left a crimson stain. The old hymn says He washed it white as snow. You hear us often say around here, the indicative comes before the imperative, so live like it. Meaning in the Bible, the identity as people of God comes before the command. The command doesn't come before the identity. Which leads us to understanding this. If we're living in God's favor as children, we recognize the standard is in no way relaxed. God doesn't relax the standard of holiness. What He did was make us children who are now capable of living in it. God didn't say, Behold, I'm the Lord your God who purchased you out of the land of slavery, so get after sin. Eat sin to your heart's full. No. He gave them some laws to say, this is kind of what it starts looking like being my people. And of course, they misused that and abused that, and we have a tendency to do the same thing. So don't misunderstand. If we are in Christ, we don't have to earn God's favor. We have it, but we need to recognize that the standard isn't relaxed. He's holy, and He demands holiness from us. What changes for us in this new work of the gospel is a desire and an ability. He gives us a new heart that wants holiness. Which is why when you sin, you hate it. Right? You think, why did I do that? That was so stupid. And that, you should think that. Because if you don't think that, there's a problem. The new heart goes, that was awful. Great God in Cush. What am I thinking? Right? But then you quickly run to the truth that I'm a child he actually gives us a new heart that wants to be holy and He gives us His Spirit to actually pull off growth and righteousness. Third and finally, don't live transactionally with God. Don't live transactionally with God. If you're a Christian, live in relationship with God. He's given us His Spirit by which we cry, Father. In other words... There is absolutely nothing you can do to get more of God or get Him to like you more. All that favor has already been given in Jesus. So don't live transactionally thinking, well, if I do this, then this is going to happen, right? Don't, don't, don't adopt karma as a worldview into your spirituality. If I do enough good, God's going to bless me. No, that's not how that works. God's not a transactional God. The only transaction that He's processed was at the cross where He exchanged my sin for Jesus' righteousness. And I get that by faith. But don't live transactionally. It begins in repentance and faith. Come to Jesus, believe. It then progresses in learning to live life with God as a real and present Father. In God's Word, you're going to learn the Holy Spirit's presence and ministry. If God is our Father, part of our task is learning how to relate to our Father. 
And we learn to relate by being in His Word, which is why we push Bible reading and tell you to do it over and over again because it's in reading the Bible that you will learn the work of the Holy Spirit and His supernatural, powerful presence that animates the relationship between father and son, and father and daughter. You will only walk with God as you learn your relationship with Him from His Word and experience the practicing of what you learn, which is why we teach you discipleship is hear and obey. You don't really know until you've done what He said to do. Knowledge is never merely academic. It's always next experiential. We hear and then we obey. And when we obey, we learn Holy Spirit's supernatural power. As we live in this relationship, we learn more about God's love for and acceptance of us in spite of our sin. Listen, man, I told you there's nobody in this room that's not messed up. We all messed up. I'm messed up. Man, last night, I railed on my kids for a little bit because they were having a little tiff between them about a stupid video game and time watching a stupid movie. And one of them grabbed one of my power cords off my computer and put it on something. And I blamed it on another one. And I'm yelling, ah, God, rock, oh, kill you. Oh. I didn't say kill you. Wanted to, felt like it, right? And then afterward, I'm like, God, I hate, why? why? Fool, stupid. I, and I'm beating myself up. And I'm trying to do this transaction with God. I go, it's time to go to bed, too. I'm mad because I got past my bedtime. I had to fight. Rah, 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 rah. And I'm laying, I'm mad. I lay down there and I'm going, well, I guess I can just lay here awake and pray to make God like me. I'm thinking, I literally thought that if I just pray enough, God will not hate me for it. And I went off to sleep, got up mad this morning. Like, you fool. And then I thought, oh, God, you got to preach about grace. And I don't know my mind. Just quit. Go far. Just quit it all. Right? And, and, and it is so wired in our flesh to be transactional with God because, man, we all messed up. And we think we've got to pay for it. Sons never have to pay for a relationship with a father. Daughters never have to pay for a relationship with a father. It just is a reality. And if we're daughters and sons of God, we have him as father. So don't live transactionally. Just receive. Just receive. Which, by the way, the jolly boys, all they do is receive. They ain't gave me junk yet. <laughs> all they do is eat, 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 take, 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 more, more, more. And you know what? That's okay. That's a great delight. And as sinful as even my sinful delight is in that, God's is never sinful. He just gives, gives, gives. And we receive, 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 and we glorify Him for it. Which is why the Psalms will say, Thanksgiving is real worship. And you come and say, Thank you. And God goes, You're welcome. That's what I do as a father. So let's end our time praying corporately, and then we're going to worship in song. So if you would bow your heads with me, we're going to pray what we've been praying for a few weeks. The band's going to come and prepare to lead us in response and worship. Ezekiel 36, 37, and 38, this I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them, to increase their people like a flock, like the flocks at Jerusalem during her appointed feast, so the waste cities are filled with flocks of people, and then they will know I am the Lord. Three things we see in that passage. Increase of people, increase of holiness, and increase in sending. So take 10 seconds and ask the Lord of the harvest to increase our laborers for the work. Ready? Pray. Now, Take 10 seconds and ask the Lord to increase our holiness. Now take 10 seconds and ask the Lord to increase our sending. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you would take your word and make it effective in spite of my foolishness and my sin and my love of my own flesh. 
Make your word powerful and effective. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would awaken to life those that the Father has given the Son, that upon hearing the voice of the Son, they would spring to life and run to Jesus. I pray that you will increase our holiness, that we wouldn't be satisfied with our sin, that it's, well, okay, it's sin, so I'm forgiven, so let me keep sinning. No, that's not good enough. Forgive, but Father, empower to walk away from and run to holiness, to light, to righteousness, and not be content with darkness. Well, then we pray for sending that, Lord, you, you said, ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers. So, Lord of the harvest, would you send laborers? Call them out. May they hear that call through a holy desire and a vocational opportunity to make disciples among the nations.